Pastor, on this lovely Father's Day morning, had a few announcements from the pulpit here. Uh, first up, this Wednesday, is the church is going to be providing a lunch at the Ronald McDonald House. Um, everybody who's involved in that, there's going to be a brief meeting after service today in the library. Uh, on July 3rd, uh, men's breakfast on July 3rd, they're meeting this, this month over at Taylor's, over on North Davis Highway. And let's see. Now as an update for the fundraiser for the piano, we are in holding at 80 at 30 keys. So kind of in a holding pattern. It's, again, only three octaves, only an octave and a half. Coming a little bit more than that would be a, a successful piano. Are there any other notes on the floor? Here you can see that. It's not a pair of hearts and minds for worship.
This is truly the day the Lord has made, and we are going to rejoice and be glad in it. So please join with me as I pray a morning prayer of praise and adoration for our time with Him. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, Lord and Creator of the universe, and in all of us that live and breathe and move and have our very being, Lord, let us now come into your presence, aided by and guided by the Holy Spirit, as we seek to worship you in spirit and in truth. Open our ears to the words of light, that we may be blessed by the hearing of your holy word, proclaimed through prayer and music and preaching. And we humble ourselves and be receptive to the teaching of your holy word, and give to you and your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, all the glory and honor due to his holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today's call to worship comes to us from Psalm 116. When shall we return to you, O God, for all your bounty to us? O Lord, I am your servant the child of your serving girl. You have loosed my bonds. Our opening hymn is This Is My Father's World. Please stand if you're able for that opening hymn. <coughs> How many fathers do you have? One. You 
sure? I don't think so. I think, what's that? I got my I got my Okay. I think you've got two fathers, really. You know that? I got Papa. Oh, you got Papa, yeah. Well, that means you got three fathers. <laughs> yes, well, every day is Grandparents' Day, as we, as we know. The Bible tells us that we have another father also, a father we can't see. You know who he's called? Oh, God, he's our Heavenly Father. There's a piece in the Bible here that talks about our Heavenly Father, and it says, Have you not known that since the very beginning I've loved you as a child? I've held you in my hand. I see you each day of your life. Your very name is written on the palm of my hands. You know that? That's the palm of your hand. What the Bible is saying, that God looks at us each and every day, and He sees your name. He sees your name Riley, and He says, I love you. Isn't that a great thought? Yeah. To think about that. All of our names are written on the palm of God's hands. Let's pray, okay? Heavenly Father, we thank you that yes, we have our earthly fathers, but we're more blessed to know that we have a Father in Heaven whose our very names are always before Him, beholding us and loving us unconditionally. And we're thankful for that as we celebrate fathers everywhere, Lord. To know that we have the unchanging love of our Heavenly Father God. And we praise you for that in your name. Amen. All right. You are free to go to the Children's Church. And I'd like to go too. But I can't. of God's love is that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Assured already of his grace and forgiveness by his finished work on the cross, it's now our opportunity to come before him and to take and confess our transgressions. So let us now go to a moment of prayer and silent confession before our Heavenly Father. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have promised freedom from sin for your people reconciliation to you through your son. We confess that we have fallen short many times of the commands that you have given us. We have transgressed your steadfast word by our wayward actions. We confess that we have grown comfortable sometimes with our bad habits. We want to follow Jesus and his saving grace. And so Lord, forgive us, we pray. Let us now, in the silence of our hearts, confess our trespasses against you and your word.
by using our Apostles' Creed. Please stand for Abel for that creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into the hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. <coughs>
vows, I pray a prayer of illumination for the reading and hearing of God's holy word. Let us pray. <coughs> God of wisdom, I call upon you once again to speak your liberating, illuminating, and powerful word to us today. By the holy power of Holy Spirit poured into our hearts today, make us ready and willing to respond to the call of your words. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. May I rightly divide your word of truth, and may that word of truth be edifying to our minds, but most of all convicting to our hearts. And may it bring glory and honor not to me, but to your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our Old Testament reading this morning comes from the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 18. I'll be reading verses 1, 1 through 15. You may recall if you were here last week that I read the promise of God to Abraham in Genesis 12 about the Abrahamic covenant, the covenant that God had made with this one man and this one race of people. It was a threefold covenant, you may recall. It was offering him the land the land of Israel, the boundaries of it, that would be the promised land. It promised also that they would be a chosen people, a chosen people, and through them all the world would be blessed. And finally, God promised him offspring, that children would come as a result, through Abraham and Sarah. That threefold promise was accomplished because God's word is true. But the message of Genesis 18 this morning combines other things too. It combines a message also about hospitality, which was very important in the ancient Middle Eastern world. It was a sacred duty to all people. And because we belong to God and when we encounter strangers, we too are called to receive them as people who already belong to us, who are already part of God's family. And as such, we welcome them also as God's children. Now the promise of Abraham and Sarah, as you recall from last week, was a threefold promise that I just said. But that third promise, the promise of the fact that Abram was already 100 years old at this time and Sarah was 90. And so the promise probably was just blown off simply because, you know, how can this be? Well, in this conversation that we have this morning, we have actually an angel of the Lord appearing with three men. And they're on their way to two cities, two wicked cities, Sodom and Gomorrah. They're on their way to execute judgment upon those cities. Now, whenever you see in the Old Testament the term angel of the Lord, that is what is considered to be a theophany. Just a big word, theophany. But what it means is a pre-incarnate appearance, a pre-human appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ appeared in many passages in the Old Testament. Of course, he, in the New Testament, he came in the form of a human being, of course, being born of human flesh, but an angel of the Lord, whenever you hear that in the Old Testament, that means Christ himself. So they're on their way, and they stop, and of course, Abram provides hospitality to these strangers. And he also, the stranger gives him a promise that's going to be fulfilled. Hear now the word of the Lord. I will read the actual birth account of Isaac next week when we consider Genesis chapter, chapter 21. The, the name Isaac is, is the Hebrew name Yitzhak. Yitzhak means laughter, because of course, as we see in this reading this morning, Sarah laughs at the fact that she's going to conceive a child and give birth at the age of 90. Here now the word of the Lord. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be bought, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, Make quickly three measures of choice flour needed and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant, who hastened to prepare it. And he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared to set before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, Where is your wife, Sarah? And he said, There in the tent. 
Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance and behind him. Now as Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age, and had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed at herself, saying, After I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I be fruitful? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the same time, I will return to you in due season, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, Yes, you did laugh. Continuing on our New Testament reading this morning from the Epistle of Romans, Paul's letter to the church at Rome. In Romans 5, 1 through 8, that I'll be reading, Paul explains the benefits of the gospel. For those who have been justified by faith and stand in new relationship to God. You may recall from last Sunday's sermon where I developed a theological doctrine of justification. It's just if I never sinned because of Christ's righteousness. And so Paul develops this idea further. The further fact the matter that our justification, our freedom from sin, is only as a result of what Christ did for us. Out of God's love for us, he gave his son as the atonement for our sins. And so Apostle Paul in these verses presents three fundamental proofs, three fundamental proofs of the love of God, his amazing love that the Father has for us. In other words, of the Lord, Romans chapter 5, beginning with verse 1. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak as sinners, at the right time God died for the ungodly, Indeed, rarely would anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. May God add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his holy word. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As you probably know, people are always making promises. A good example, of course, is, is marriage. When two people come in before God and witnesses uh, certain battles of love. You know, a young man may promise to love a young woman and wants to marry her, but if she has any sense, she may say, well, prove that love to me. But sadly, as we know, one out of two marriages fail. So somewhere along the way, the proof of that love did not remain in their commitment to one another. I've heard many promises. I've heard uh, agreements, confessions that later on in people's lives proved to be meaningless. But Romans here in chapter 5, especially verses 6 through 8, declares that God the Father is not just making a promise when he says he loves us. He has proved his love for us beyond a doubt, beyond disputation. There is no other way you can prove God's love than through these verses that Paul takes and tells us here in Romans. He writes, but God demonstrates his own for love for us while we were still sinners. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The words of the Apostle Paul demonstrate the fundamental truth of the Reformed Presbyterian faith in what we call the doctrine of God. It's ultimately expressed in the love of God the Father. Which, by the way, is the title of the sermon this morning. The love of God the Father. You know, I believe this topic is most appropriate when you think about it when we honor today or celebrate fathers. Now, I realize many of us grew up with fathers, and that was a blessing. However, some of us may have had absent fathers or no fathers in our lives, but we may have had father figures. It could have been a close relative, it could have been an uncle, it could have been a grandparent, it could have been a neighbor, a teacher, a coach, 
someone who filled in for that father figure role. But perhaps like me, who grew up with a father in the house, but now that man has passed away and he is in glory, I no longer have him physically as part of my life. And that may be the case with you also, for your fathers may have gone on to glory. But we all have a heavenly father in God himself, just as I said this morning in our children's sermon. We all have two fathers. One may be absent, but one is never absent, God our Father. And most importantly, he manifests his eternal love for us in many ways. There are actually four words, four words in the Greek language, and as you know, the New Testament was written in Greek. There are four words for love that the Greeks used. You can refer to those in their bulletin. I have it under the vocabulary section at the bottom. But the first one is storge. Storge love it speaks of the affection between parents and children, or things that you love inanimately, like I love chocolate cake, or I love my dog, or I love my son, or I love my daughter. That's storge love. That's storge love. That's one type of love. There's of course philia, philia love, which means love between friends, sisters, and brothers. Brotherly love. And you know, of course, the city of Philadelphia <coughs> is the city of brotherly love. Or should be. Anyway, the third type of love is Eros. Eros was, of course, the Greek god of love. It represented many times by Cupid uh, in, in Greek mythology, uh, the son of Aphrodite, the goddess of love, if you will. It refers to romantic love. It refers to a combination of romantic and sexual love. It's the type of intimate love that's best exemplified in a couple that are married to one another. And then the fourth type of love is the highest form of love that the Greeks used. And it's the words that Paul is using here. It's that word agape, agape love. It's rarely used in the classical Greek, but it's commonly found in the New Testament. And it's only used when it's speaking of either God or his son, Jesus Christ, when the word love is used, agape love. <laughs> It's a love that is holy, it's gracious, it's sovereign, it's everlasting, it's unconditional, it's sacrificial love that never ends. It's God's love for us as his children. His love for us is agape, it's agape love. It's the type that Paul talks about when he talks about in, in the letter to the Ephesian church, in Ephesians 5, he says that Christ loved the church so much, the church, the body of believers, that's you and me, that he gave his life for it. He gave his agape, unconditional love for the church. In Galatians, Paul says that the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. That's right. That's what atonement is, as I said last week. Somebody stood in our place. You and I were all on death row. But we got a reprieve because a person stood in and went to the table for us and received the lethal injection. The capital punishment that was due you and me. And that's what atonement is. And all of us are familiar with the Apostle John tells us in 3.16 about how God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son. And when he says that word, the word world there, he's using the Greek word cosmon. And it means the entire world. God loved the entire world. He didn't just love a certain race of people. Yes, the Jewish people, the chosen people of God. But through them, as I said last week, everyone will be blessed. All the nations will be blessed. Because out of him would become the chosen one, our Savior Jesus Christ. And so I think the greatest demonstration that agape love, it gives, it serves, it sacrifices, and is also willing to die in place of another. The other three types of love do not take and fit that high calling, that high calling. It's a love that is what I call immutable. And I have that word there, immutable, in your vocabulary. Immutable means it's unchanging. It cannot be bent or shaped or changed in any way. It's never ending love. It's God's love for us, so much so that he chose you and me before the very beginning of the world, before the very foundation of the world, he tells us in Ephesians. He chose us to be the elect of God. It's a humbling thought when you think about it, that he foreknew, he foreknew who would be predestined to salvation in us. Before we were even born, before we were even thought of, before we were even conceived. It's a love so great, you think about this agape love, but it's beyond human comprehension. It's a love really better than life here itself, if you think about it, because it's a love that never ends. It's eternal love. It's a love that even death cannot destroy. 
It's the love that enables saints of God throughout history, have we seen, to go through innumerable trials and tribulations and punishment and be martyred for their faith, but still the love of God prevails. And during the course of my ministry, I have preached many of a, a funeral sermon, a memorial service, a graveside service, if you will, where the words of the Apostle Paul in chapter 828 are so important because it says, I'm sure you've heard them before, these are Paul speaking, for I am convinced, Paul says, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's a comforting thought to think that not even death can separate us from his love. Even in the moment of our death, we are immediately ushered into the presence of our Heavenly Father. Why? Because of His agape love. So the question I ask each of you this morning to ponder on this Father's Day, especially when we're considering our Heavenly Father and the love of God the Father, is have you experienced, have you in your individual life experienced this love of God the Father? You know, Paul states that it's poured out in abundance. It's abundance in our hearts. And every true Christian can experience it. But I wonder how many people have really experienced the love of God. It's a love that motivates us to share the good news with others. And it causes us to even to rejoice in tribulations. Because we know that this life is passing by. And there's a greater glory beyond. So I just like to look briefly here this morning at three important proofs of God's love in this passage. So first of all, is that the Father loves us with a common grace. Under his common grace, God shows love for everyone, even those who hate him. Okay? God shows us love. Jesus tells us this. Love your enemies. Pray for them, he says. Paul speaks of it. He has shown kindness because it rains on the good and the bad. He gives shelter and food to all of his creation. He doesn't pick and choose in who's to be blessed and who's not to be blessed. James says, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights of which there is no shifting or shadows, no changing, no changing. But the more important thing is that God loves his elect, you and me, with a special type of love that saves us from our sins and makes us saints. Small s, makes us saints. If you're going to ask because I said, it makes us justified. Justified. If you think about it, what does that love call us to do? God tests our love sometimes. He tests our love for Him. His love never changes. But our love sometimes can be fickle when it comes to God. Next week, next week I'm going to be reading a story uh, about, of course, uh, no, I'm not going to read next week, I'm going to read two weeks from now. Next week I'll read the story of how Isaac is born to Abraham and Sarah. But then two weeks from now, I will be reading the story about how God calls that only son that Abraham has through Sarah and tells him to go off to a place called Mount Moriah, tie the boy up and place him on an altar and sacrifice him to God. And through faith, Abraham carries out that wish. He actually takes him just about the time he's about to take and plunge the knife into the boy. God says, stop. I know that you love me. What kind of faith is that? That you could sacrifice your own child? But he demonstrated this love there and then through Abraham. And, of course, continued those three cool promises. Of course, the boy lived. The chosen people, they get the land. All the nations are blessed through them. But we see the love of the Father that Paul says he didn't even spare his own son. God didn't even spare his own son, if you think about it. When he went to the cross. And that's because God loves us and God chose us. We did not choose him. For those God foreknew, Paul tells us he loved and he predestined. You think about this there, it's going, to be a, it's going to be a day, of course, when God's going to pour out his, his judgment, his wrath upon the unrighteous. But that's not at all. Not only his wrath, but God's being revealed. But the love of God is also being revealed in that that love is a continuing love for us. Even though we may fall by the wayside, even though we may sin, God doesn't change his mind about us. That love is a Greek word, sunestesin where it means it's continuing, okay? Nothing stops the flow of that abundant love that God has for us. It means ongoing, 
never-ending love. And the cross, the cross is constantly revealing and demonstrating the love of God the Father for us. People don't meditate upon the cross enough, but if you think about that, there is power. There is power in the cross of Christ. That power is the power of God for salvation. Only because of that atonement that God gave up His Son to do for us. You know, salvation is not a joint venture. It's not 50-50 where I give 50% and God gives 50%. It's not 99%. For instance, uh, I give 1% and God gives 99 Salvation is all by God's grace from first to last. And because of that, our salvation is totally secure. We cannot lose it. It is the eternal security of the believer. Yes, we can fall down in sin, but the grace of God covers our sins. The unconditional, unchanging, agape love of God. God is not promising to love us. He has proved us throughout history that he does love us. The second proof of God's love clearly is that when we were enemies with God, he still loved us. Much more so in that passage from John 3.16 that Christ died for the entire world. He died for the ungodly also. But when we were in rebellion, God still loved us. And it tells us that, he, that Jesus is just not a prophet or an angel, but he's the only beloved son of God. The only one who could pay that price for our fallen nature. And consequently, he was the sinless Son of God, the eternal deity, who has always been with the Father and the Holy Spirit from the beginning of creation. Why? Because God sent his Son to be flesh just like us. It had to be a fleshly human sacrifice to cover our sins. And think about that when you read the story of the crucifixion, where God turned his back on his own Son, and darkness covered the land. Think about that. Being rejected by your own father because you had to bear the weight of the sins of the world. That's all of our sins. That's all my past sins. That's all my present sins. That's all the sins I'm going to commit in the future. All of those, each and every one of us, throughout all of humanity, weighed Christ down on that cross. You can't even fathom the agony of what that could have been. The price that was paid. We were spared because Christ died for our benefit. We sinned, but Christ died for our sin. And he did die, so we would not have to die eternally. You know, you and I, yes, we will, we will die a spiritual death, but we our physical death, but we will not die a spiritual death. Because Jesus said, whoever lives and believes in me will never die. You know, when Dr. Carl Hart, Dr. Carl Hart, probably the greatest theologian of the 20th century, came on a lecture tour of America back in the 1960s. He went to different theological seminaries. And at one seminary, at the University of Chicago, he was asked by a student, what is the greatest thought that ever went through your mind, Dr. Bart? Now here was a renowned theologian who had basically exhausted just about everything you could think about when it comes to scripture and theology, especially of the Reformed and Presbyterian faith. And Barth looked at the class that was there and he said to them, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Did you ever say that in Sunday school as a child? Yeah, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Yes, Jesus loves me. If you know nothing else about God, nothing else about the Bible, nothing else about theology, nothing else about Presbyterianism or the Reformed faith, all you need to know is this fundamental truth, is that Jesus loves me, this I know. Period. The entire Old Testament sacrificial system pointed to Christ, pointed to that perfect lamb that had to be sacrificed to cover the people's sins. And it was done daily, the sacrifice of the Jewish people, continually. But then Jesus came into the world to become the final sacrifice. And yes, on the cross, what did he say? It is finished. It's finished. And at that moment of his death, the curtain in the temple was ripped in two. No longer do we have to come to the Holy of Holies. No longer do we have to come to God through animal sacrifices. God was now with us in the person and work and form of the life and the ministry and death of his son, Jesus Christ. And he's at work in our lives today, friends, in the power and work of the Holy Spirit, demonstrating his love for us constantly, constantly. 
And the third and final proof that saves us is that God, as I said, did not die just for the righteous, but for the unrighteous. He didn't die for just good people either. Because none of us are really good if you think about it. We try to be good. We work at it. But perhaps some people may dare to die for good people. But I remember reading a story years ago uh, by Donald Gray Barnhouse, who was a longtime pastor at 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia. It was told by Dr. James Boyce, his, his successor at that church. And the story went like this. Two men were trapped in a mine cave in, and poisonous gas was escaping. One man had a wife and three children. He also had a gas mask, but the gas mask was damaged in the mine cave in. And he would have perished except for the act of the man who was trapped with him. The second man took off his mask and said to him, who survived, you are married and have two children. I am alone. They need you. Take my mask. That's what the substitutionary death of Christ did. Whether that man was good or bad, a substitute was placed in our form, and that was in the form of Christ. But Christ did not die for just nice people. He died for everyone. Such an act of love never happened in history. You know, a man may die for his family and friends, but, but not for wicked people. You do not stand in the way and take us. Yes, we would do anything to save our children's lives, even if it meant the cost of our own lives. But someone we don't even know. Seriously. We were not really sick. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. But when we think about it, Paul tells us that in Romans chapter 3, that all of sin that comes short of that glory. And so the saving knowledge for us is that when we become regenerate, when we realize what the cost of the cross was for Christ our lives, we can celebrate that love of God the Father each and every day of our lives. That's why Jesus was crucified. Yet Christ's death was, that, that death was part of God's plan. It was the Father handed His Son over willingly to be crucified. And the wrath of God was poured out, as I said, on his son. Our sins put him there. He didn't spare us, so he could spare us from eternal damnation. How much more proof could we ask of the Father's love for us? As I conclude, when I was growing up in high school, I, um, I was on my high school football team, and I played, uh, I played center for the team. And I also was on our, our high school wrestling team. And my father made it a point to be always at my football games and at, at my wrestling matches. And sometimes I could, I could mess up a snap and maybe fail to make a block. Or maybe sometimes I, I, I did not take and pin the person to the man. But my father said, that's okay, you gave your best, you tried. And that's the important thing. And that made me feel good that he knew that even though I had come up short, he was still there rooting me on. But then there was, of course, the time when report cards had come out. And if I didn't have straight A's, my father would look at me with consternation. And believe you me, for me, math was a continual challenge, especially trigonometry and calculus. Believe me, it was a struggle. And I wanted my father to be proud of me, but he would look at that report card and he would say to me, Son, God has given you a brilliant mind. Why aren't you applying yourself? You're basically lazy. You can do this if you buckle down and persevere. And that hurt me to a degree because I had made my father displeased with me. But how many times in our own lives do we do things that displease our Heavenly Father? Yes, He chastises us. But that made me all the more determined that I was going to take and bring the math grades up. And I did. Yes, it took work. Yes, it took effort. Yes, I had to have a tutor. But I did it. And the pleasing thought that when my father saw that, I wanted the love and approval of my father. And my friends, I don't think we should ask anything else of our Heavenly Father. When we come up short, there are things that we should do. Things that we should do to work harder and harder to celebrate that love of God the Father that He has given for us. Therefore, I'll leave you with just a few things. Survey that wondrous cross. Meditate on the object of God's love. Yes, that's an object of God's love. And there is power in that cross. There is power in that cross. Study your Bible carefully. Fill your mind with God's Word. And your heart will be overflowing. Each and every page of this book is God's love story for us. It's written on the pages of Scripture. And if you don't believe it, it is signed and sealed with His blood. 
on that cross. Set your minds on heavenly things. Paul talks about this in his letter to the church of Colossae. In Colossians 3, he says, set your minds on things above. Well, not on earthly things, for you have died. You're already dead. Believe it or not, you're dead to your sins, and now you have life eternal. Your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And then, live the abundant, joy-filled life, knowing that you have without a doubt a Father in heaven who eternally and unconditionally loves you with an agape love. It's not a fickle love. It's not a love that's going to change. It's immutable. And God is, as I said this morning, your very names are written. Now, I know that that's a metaphor. Of course, you know, God does not have hands like that. But the mere thought that God loves us so much that he knows our very names and that he's in our very lives each and every day and he's loving and caring for us. And that should motivate each and every one of us to proclaim daily the good news of the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and his gospel. And to pray as we do in our Lord's Prayer for thy kingdom to come. And finally, friends, finally, to look forward to that day with anticipation when our Lord Jesus Christ returns and sets the world right and recreates the Eden that we lost back because of the original sin of Adam and Eve in the garden. That recreation, behold, he tells us in the book of Revelation, behold, I make all things new. Look forward to that coming of Christ. And if not in our lifetime, then live with assurance that one day you will die and you will meet your Savior face to face, Jesus Christ, who will welcome you into his eternal kingdom. And I can't wait to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord for all time and eternity. My dear friends, that's the good news. Believe it, love it, enjoy it, know it, savor it. Let it envelope you every day of your lives. Even when we fall, damn, our Father in heaven picks us up. He dusts us off and points us back in the right direction. This love of the Father, as I said, is our changing. Therefore, I urge you to believe it and live it with a joy unspeakable and full of glory. There should be no such thing as a sad countenance among Christians. Because if you're going around with a frown on your face, then you obviously don't know the joy of your salvation. And you need to meditate on the love of God the Father and what he has done for you. So my friends, I ask you, come as you are, and he will receive you and save you, knowing for sure the love of God the Father. And may God help us to be convicted each and every day of our lives by the unending, unchanging love of God proven to us by these words of the Apostle Paul. And may we experience the joy of that salvation each and every day of our lives. To God be the glory in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God sent his disciples out into the world and began to carry out his work, trusting in God's provision to carry out and handle their needs. We give out our abundance to continue the work of Christ in the world today. And so with faith and hope, let us offer our gifts to God now as we worship Him with our morning tithes and offerings. <laughs>
Gracious, loving God, use these gifts to transform the world, to bring about your justice, peace, and reconciliation for all of your creation. Transform us as we offer them to be partners and co-creators, as disciples that you have given us the work to do. May we continue to use them to advance the ministry and mission of our church as we are called to do for your glory and that of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.
service. <laughs> Here now descending forth, see what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. As children of our Heavenly Father, God, go forth from here knowing that you are loved as a member of God's family throughout all time and eternity. Receive now the benediction. Unto him, our Lord God, eternal, immortal, invisible, godly wise, with all glory and power and dominion and majesty, may you, that same God, bless us and keep us. May you make your face to shine upon us. May you lift up your favor upon us and grant us your everlasting peace this day forth and forevermore. Amen and amen.